pointing our hearts and minds to the one true God, the maker of heaven and earth. Well, good morning and happy Thanksgiving online. And of course, to everyone here in, per- in person, it's great to uh, be with you and you have the opportunity to jump back into our series on the life of Elijah. If you're new to uh, Bay Park or new to this series um, called Detour, we're acknowledging the fact that detours are inevitable in this life. We all face detours at different times. And of course, they come in all kinds of shapes and forms, sometimes in the form of a broken relationship or the, the end of a work relationship that might not have um, been anticipated, sometimes uh, a crisis in, in the life of one of our children, or it could have been an unexpected move or a diagnosis. And so the question that's sort of guiding us throughout the series then is how do we navigate these detours in our life and still maintain the destination that God has for us? in and through all of that. And so the title of this fifth message in the series is Spectacular Drives. I want to begin with a bit of a poll this morning. What is the most spectacular drive you've ever driven? If you're online, put it in the chat here. If you're in the auditorium, just shout it out. What's the most spectacular drive or road trip you've ever taken? Algonquin, yes, spectacular. Niagara Falls, for sure. Rockies. The Amalfi Coast, amazing. All right, we're going to throw a few up here just in case uh, uh, you've, you've not had a chance to see these to whet your appetite, maybe. Um, has anyone done the Sea to Sky Highway, with uh, Vancouver to Whistler? Pretty, pretty amazing. All right, Cabot Trail, anyone? Yeah, awesome, awesome for sure. And uh, Icefields Parkway, I think someone already mentioned this, Alberta, the Rockies. I mean, this country is just it almost endless opportunities to really explore, explore some spectacular drives. Uh, well, in this series so far, we've seen Elijah drive down some pretty dark roads in his calling as a prophet of Israel, right? We've, we've seen him take on some, some dangerous assignments. We've even seen him, you know, at the Kareth Ravine and, and with the widow of Zarephath, kind of at the end of his road at times. And then in part four of this series, the last time uh, we were in 1 Kings chapter 18, we saw him face this major distraction in the person of Obadiah, who is this palace administrator for King Ahab, trying to dissuade him and distract him from the calling that God had placed upon his life to uh, confront him. And and so here we find ourselves now in verse 16 of chapter 18. And and I've given this message the title, uh, Spectacular Drives, because perhaps for the first time in this series on Elijah, we get to see... Elijah drive down this spectacular road in his calling uh, as a prophet of Israel. And that was a tough calling, right? A lot lot of times it involves the dark drives, the the dangerous roads. But finally we get to see him uh, take this incredible uh, drive in his calling. And in this case, it is to confront the the prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel. So buckle up, 1 Kings 18, verses 16 and following. We're going to kind of take it verse by verse and then unpack a few truths um, from the text. I think this is page 284 in the Pew Bibles, uh, if you're um, using that. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Talk about a royal greeting. Finally, they have this encounter, and I'm not sure what Elijah might have been expecting, but, I mean, this is a pretty bold, uh, confrontational encounter. We remember that Elijah, for the last three years, has been public enemy number one in Israel, right? Ahab has had a a hit out on his head, in essence, an international manhunt was underway, and finally, um, they meet face to face. Now, the word troubler, troubler literally means to stir up to disturb or to bring trouble. And that's exactly what Ahab accuses Elijah of. Ironically, let's look at Elijah's response in verse 18. I love his boldness here. He says, I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed uh, the Baals. And despite the fact that King Ahab goes on the offensive, Elijah puts it right back upon him. He instead identifies 
King Ahab as the real troubler of Israel and points him in the direction of the ways that he's been violating God's will and his word. One, abandoning the Lord's commands and following the Baals. And, and maybe you remember back in chapter 16 how King Ahab was first introduced to us as the one who did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than all of the kings that came before him. And in this confrontation here, Elijah unashamedly blames Ahab for the drought and the economic disaster that came upon the land as a result of his leadership. And I love this. We're getting to see more and more of Elijah's personality, his courage, his boldness. But at this point, he just starts barking out orders to the king of Israel. In verse 19, he says, Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Carmel. So despite the fact that they're butting heads about who's the real troubler of Israel, Elijah barks these orders at him, and Ahab actually responds. And in fact, he begins to send out this royal decree to gather all of Israel to assemble on Mount Carmel for this spiritual showdown of sorts. Now, the population of Israel at this point in time is probably between two and three million. People, 800 soldiers, 800,000 soldiers. We don't know the exact number of people who would have gathered, but um, in obedience to that royal decree, it says that all of Israel showed up. So I'm guessing at least hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Israelites show up en masse on Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, um, to witness what was about uh, to unfold. Now, why Mount Carmel? A couple of reasons. One, this was a well-known landmark. You can see a picture of it here. It's about 1,800 feet above sea level. It's like a 38-kilometer range of mountains, and it was well-known to the Israelites and the people in that area. It would have been a, a natural gathering point. But more than that, Mount Carmel was known to be the sacred dwelling place of Baal. And so by suggesting, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that um, the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asherah, King Ahab meet here. In essence, what Elijah is doing is giving them home field advantage. Now, we're not sure exactly how long it would have taken to assemble all of Israel, but it, the text tells us that they showed up en masse, and that's when Elijah begins to address this crowd, which, again, is probably hundreds of thousands at this point in time. This is what he says. Elijah, verse 21, went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if God is, if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Literally translated, Elijah asked the people of Israel this question, How long will you limp between two gods? In essence, what he's telling the people is that their attempt to have the best of both worlds by worshiping Baal one day and Yahweh the next day is, is literally crippling them in their journey of life and faith. I love how the, the message paraphrase translates Elijah's question, how long are you going to sit on the fence? How long will you sit on the fence? This is his confrontation to the people of Israel. If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And the response of the people of Israel is deafening silence. Absolute crickets. You see, while the people of Israel had grown up worshiping Yahweh wholeheartedly, as they were instructed to, when Ahab came to power, introduced Baal worship, they began to wander, they be, began to be distracted, and so they began to also worship Baal and, and Ashtoreth. And so their loyalties became divided. And so when Elijah asked this simple question, they simply sat in silence, guilty as charged. Then Elijah announces that he has come up with this spiritual competition of sorts to help them determine once and for all whether Yahweh is God or whether Baal is God. Verse 22 to 24. 
Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal, Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Now, despite the fact that this spiritual competition, this showdown of sorts, is Elijah's idea under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit the, the odds were really stacked in favor of, of Baal in many ways. I mean, for Baal, they had 450 prophets there representing, whereas Yahweh, of course, has uh, Elijah as its single solitary prophet. Baal, of course, has home field advantage on Mount Carmel. This is the, the sacred dwelling place uh, of Baal. Uh, the prophets of Baal, uh, if you can uh, you know, allow the football analogy, has first possession, right? Um, he lets them go first. And, of course, this is their game, right? Who, who was Baal? He was the god of lightning. And now they're on top of a mountain. I mean, in every way, this competition is set up for Baal to succeed. And so the competition uh, moves forward in verse 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it. First, since, uh, since there are so many of you, call in the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. And when they called on the, the name of Baal from morning till noon, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And so they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So the prophets of, of Baal go first. And they cry out all morning, O oh, Baal, answer us. But there's no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So then they tried dancing around the altar to try to uh, 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 arouse the, the god Baal to, to, to finally listen and respond. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So then Elijah, we can see his personality, he begins to kind of talk smack with them, right? I mean, look at the language he uses. He says, surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling, uh, maybe sleeping, and maybe you need to wake him up. One of the expressions here is a euphemism for maybe he's in the washroom, you know? And so he begins to taunt them, which um, results in them crying out even louder to, to Baal at this point in time. But once again, there was no response. No one answered. No one paid any attention. And so finally, begin to slash and cut themselves with their swords and their spears. They began to allow their blood to flow as a, a final ditch effort to try to awaken a response from Baal. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid any attention to their efforts. And so from about 9 a.m. till about 3 p.m., they shouted, they danced, they cried out louder, they, they, they slashed their bodies until the blood flowed. Uh, in verse 29, it says they pro prophesied frantically and there was no response. No one answered. No one paid any attention. Verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, 
one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water, and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. And the water ran down around the altar and then filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. So Elijah begins by rebuilding this altar, these stones that had one day uh, been a monument to Yahweh, which had probably been torn down early on in King Ahab's reign as a measure to introduce Baal worship in, in the, um, amongst the people of Israel. And then he begins to dig this massive trench around that entire altar. And, and you can almost wonder... You know, what the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asher are thinking, what is this guy up to? What kind of trick does he have up his sleeve? And then he proceeds to arrange the wood, and then he butchers the bull. He places the sacrifice on the wood, and then he orders four large jars of water to be filled to the brim, and then poured out on the sacrifice, on the wood, on the stones, on the soil, And then he orders it again and again, 12 in total, large jars filled with water poured over the sacrifice to the point at which now everything is drenched with water. And in fact, the trench is completely filled up. And then Elijah, very quietly, very simply, he asks Yahweh to show up in a clear and unmistakable way. Can you even imagine the tension on Mount Carmel that night? On one side, you've got King Ahab, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asher. On the other side, hundreds of thousands of Israelites. They've just witnessed the impotence of Baal. I mean, Baal, despite the dancing, the cutting, the crying, nothing. Silence, no response. And now Elijah makes it even harder for the the God of Israel to show up in power by drenching this sacrifice with water, quietly calls upon Yahweh to show up in power. And then it happens in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. I mean, immediately after calling out uh, to Yahweh to show up in power, Yahweh instantly incinerates the bull, incinerates the wood, incinerates the stones on the altar, the soil beneath the altar, and, and, and every last drop of water that filled that trench and soaked that sacrifice was licked up in that moment. For six hours, 450 prophets of Baal tried to get a response from their God, and it was crickets. And in the moment, Elijah quietly, humbly calls out to Yahweh, fire falls from the sky in an unmistakable, memorable demonstration of his power. And verse 39 tells us that when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And as a result, the people of Israel were convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that Yahweh was the one true God. Verse 40 goes on to tell us that then Elijah commanded them to seize the prophets of Baal and to not let anyone get away. And so they seized them and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. Well, this may seem harsh. This was simply uh, Elijah 
carrying out God's command in Deuteronomy 12, which says that a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods must be put to death. And then Elijah said to Ahab in verse 41, Go eat and drink, for the sound of heavy rain is coming. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he, he told his servant. And when he went up and looked, there's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. And the power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. And so if Yahweh's victory over Baal uh, wasn't convincing enough, uh, Elijah basically tells uh, Ahab to grab something to eat because the sound of rain was coming. Um, And then as soon as that rain cloud appear, he sends his servant to go tell Ahab to get out of there so he didn't get stuck in the rainstorm. And then after three and a half years of this devastating drought, those glorious, long-awaited raindrops began to fall. And as this torrential downpour is overtaking Ahab, God gives Elijah this supernatural ability to sprint all the way from Mount Carmel to Jezreel, and he beats King Ahab, who's on a horse and chariot, all the way back. This is a distance of 40 kilometers. Now, now what we've just read In 1 Kings 18, I mean, this may be one of the most spectacular storylines in in all of the Old Testament, right? Uh, I mean, I I hope we can roll the tape when we get to heaven and just replay this and watch it in slow motion. The fire falling from heaven, Elijah just, you know, chariots of fire in the background, can you hear it? You know, running all the way to to Jezreel. Um, This is incredible. Um, This is an incredible historical narrative And yet it's not just history, right? I mean, God has preserved and encapsulated this in the canon of Scripture to guide us and to lead us into life and our faith, Uh, particularly when we we face uh, detours in our journeys of life. And so this morning we want to draw a few truths from the text and, and try to apply them to our lives as we consider where we're at in our own journey of life and faith. And so, so the first truth I'd like us to, to draw from the text to this morning is, is that there's a connection between wavering worship and the withholding of rain. There's a connection between wavering worship and the withholding of rain. You know, the challenge that Elijah had for the, the people of Israel was this. How long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you limp along in your faith? How long will you sit on the fence? And on the other side of three and a half years of drought, probably depression, financial devastation, I can't help but to think that the Israelites recognized that there was a connection between their wavering worship and God's withholding of rain in their lives. And just as the Israelites wavered in their worship between worshiping Yahweh and worshiping uh, Baal, uh, we're no different today, right? We're drawn in. We're distracted by the the gods of our culture today. Um, Gods uh, like money and pleasure and power and work and influence and even uh, the God of self. So let me ask us a a question this morning. What are the, the small g gods? the gods of our culture today that are distracting us from wholehearted worship. When I was in high school, um, I grew up in a a God-fearing family, and they loved the Lord and raised us, you know, uh, to know Jesus. And so I had that foundation. But when I got to high school, you know, I had one one, foot firmly planted in my faith, in my church, in youth group, 
But that other foot was firmly planted in the world. And I wanted to experience what the world had to offer throughout those five years. And I got to tell you, I experienced this withholding of rain in that season of my wavering worship. And that was a miserable time for me. And I've shared that with our boys. It was such an... Um, uh, a discouraging time. My relationships weren't working. My work wasn't working. My academics were a struggle. And it wasn't until years later that I connected the dots between wavering worship and the withholding of rain. So one of the lessons we can take away from the Israelites is that there is this connection between wavering worship and the withholding of rain. Second truth I'd like us to consider this morning is that worshiping false gods is an absolute waste of our time. Now, it goes without saying that worshiping false gods is a violation of the first commandment, right? What's the first commandment? Have no other gods before me. So we know that to be true. We know that to be a violation of God's word and God's will. But I think one of the things that we can take away from the Israelites is that worshiping false gods, whether it was three, four thousand years ago or in our lives today is an absolute waste of our time. Like, think about on Mount Carmel alone, that one day, hundreds of thousands of Israelites probably travel for days on end to get there for the spiritual showdown. 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. The king of um, Israel is there. And all day long, they watch the prophets of Baal dance and cut and cry out and frantically prophesy, trying to get a rise out of, of Baal. For what? No response, no one answered, no one paid any attention. And that's in the context of three and a half years of devastating drought. Worshiping false gods is an absolute waste of time. I came to know and experience that on the heels of my high school mis- misadventures. And uh, eventually I went off... Uh, to university and and was introduced to a group called uh, Power to Change Now. It was Campus Campus Crusade for Christ. And I began to actually own my faith and and, uh, to experience uh, a fullness in my life that I'd never experienced before. But as I look back, it made me consider five lost years wavering between the gods of my culture and the God who was truly worthy of our worship. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we have the testimony of King Solomon, uh, the wisest person to ever walk this earth. And what we know from Solomon's testimony is that basically he comes to the conclusion that worshiping wisdom, worshiping pleasure, worshiping foolishness, work are all meaningless. They're, They're a chasing after the wind, he describes them to be. And at the conclusion of Ecclesiastes, he says, fear God. And keep his commandments. And this is a guy who knew a thing or two about all of those worldly pursuits. Third truth we can take away from the text this morning is that the God who demonstrates his divinity is worthy of our unwavering worship. The God who demonstrates his divinity is deserving of our unwavering worship. Notice that when Yahweh finally got the opportunity to take part in this spiritual showdown against all odds. He shows up in absolute power. And the fire fell from the Lord and incinerated everything in its path. And that produced a pretty profound response among the people of Israel. It gives a picture, at least a a glimpse of what unwavering worship can look like. And notice, first of all, that the people of Israel, they, they basically fall on their faces, humbly confessing that the Lord is God. Notice also that uh, on the heels of Elijah's prompting, they eliminate that which was standing in the way of unwavering worship. They got rid of the prophets of Baal. And I think there's a few lessons for that. Uh, for us in in all of that as well, as we consider, you know, what does unwavering worship look like for us? If we want to be unwavering in our worship, I think we also, we need to humbly confess Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And if you've never done that, I want to challenge you to consider that personally today. 
Uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. That is the promise of Scripture for you and I when we humbly confess that Jesus is Lord. And you can do that in the sincerity and the quietness of your heart. You can do that at home. You can do it anywhere. But if you've never done that, my challenge to you today is to not let another day go by before you confess Jesus is Lord and Savior. Now, many of us have, have been walking with God a long time. We have a personal relationship with Jesus. And yes, he is our Savior. And yet at times we wrestle with really whether or not he's our Lord. Whether we're really wanting to, to take direction from him in our day-to-day -day lives. Especially when it counters some of our instincts or some of the distractions we, we face from the, the gods of our culture around us. So this morning, my challenge to you is if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you would make that decision today as we close in prayer in a few minutes. And if you're struggling to make Jesus your Lord, to confess that before him and to also recognize um, that in order to make Jesus your Savior and Lord, in order to um, demonstrate unwavering worship in your life, you need to eliminate that which stands in the way of unwavering worship. You need to eliminate that which is distracting you in your journey of faith. Which leads us to our fourth and final uh, truth this morning, that unwavering worship opens the floodgates of heaven. This is the good news in the text. Once the Israelites have fallen on their faces, they've confessed that the Lord is God. Once they had eliminated that which was standing in the way of unwavering worship, notice that God opens the floodgates of heaven and the rain comes pouring down. And you can imagine after three and a half years of drought, what that first rain shower must have felt like. I'm sure they were like sprinting home, celebrating, dancing, tongues catching raindrops on the way back home. It must have been a celebration. They had been wavering in their worship for three and a half years. Um, God had been withholding rain upon the land. They were dehydrated. They were probably depressed. They were probably on this brink of financial disaster. And then one day, they're invited to this spiritual showdown. God shows up in power, demonstrates once and for all that he is the one true God. And then it begins to happen. The skies grow dark. The winds whip up. And for the first time in three and a half years, those glorious raindrops begin to fall. And when you and I confess Jesus as Lord and we worship him wholeheartedly, we shouldn't be surprised if we start to see the, the floodgates of heaven open up. And it usually isn't this instantaneous, right? It doesn't usually work that way. I mean, this isn't the prosperity gospel we're talking about. This is the cause and effect of aligning our life with God's will and God's word and God's ways. Unwavering worship can open the floodgates of God's blessing in our lives. And I experienced this in my journey of faith early on after five lost years of high school after giving, being given the challenge to, to really own my faith through, through Campus Crusade and, and really going after um, this faith as my own, no longer the faith of my parents, I began maybe month to month to experience that, that shower of God's blessing upon my academics, upon my work, and even upon my relationships. And there's no coincidence that in that period of time, I met my sweetheart, who's now been my wife of 26 years. Uh, talk about uh, the blessing of God uh, in my life. So this morning, as we close in prayer, let me ask us these questions as a response to God's word uh, this morning. Are you experiencing the spiritual drought uh, in your life right now? Have you been wavering between the, the God of the Bible and the God, small g, gods of this culture? And let me invite you to uh, confess the Lord as your one true God this morning. Let me challenge you to abandon the false gods that are an absolute waste of your time and mine so that you can experience that refreshing rain of God's blessing upon your life. And if you're already experiencing that, that refreshing rain to some degree in your life as you look back 
upon decisions you've made and the desire to wholeheartedly worship God, then this Thanksgiving weekend, this time as we close in, in prayer, just pour out your gratitude to God for his grace in your life. My hope and, and my prayer for all of us, wherever we're at in our journey of faith, is to come to know and experience what unwavering worship looks like and to have a taste of that refreshing reign of God's blessing in our lives. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we acknowledge that we are easily distracted like the Israelites by the world around us, the gods of our culture today, the small g gods. Father, we acknowledge that we have wavered in our worship at times, maybe wavering right now. And Father, we know that you desire wholehearted worship, and not just for you, but also that we might experience the refreshing rain that goes along with that. So we just acknowledge this morning that we need your help by your Spirit. Would you guide our hearts to confess the neat things that we need to confess? And would you inspire and empower us to worship you and you alone in ways that bring great glory and honor to you? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.